I got so mesmerized by your stories, <laughs> I didn't even look at my notes. <laughs> okay, apologies. That was one I was kind of curious about. Um, now, you mentioned a lot of these things, like they wouldn't let you have guy friends. We talked about texts and emails. We went there. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to get back to that. Okay, we'll start again. We're back, and this is Joan with the Joan Yurkovich Show. Two very interesting guests, kind of an emotional morning here as we talk to two young ladies, one 27 years old and one just 16 years old, who have had history of uh, violent dating relationships. So let me ask you, ladies, um, did these people, these men you were dating, did you know in looking back, did they have a history of treating other women yes. like this? Yes. Okay. But you didn't know that at the time. Not really. Yeah. It was just rumor. It was all, you know, and, and they play, they probably made their excuses. Did they make excuses for some of the way they acted? Um, oh, yes. Um, my boyfriend would always say that he grew up watching his father hit his mother, and that was always his biggest excuse for treating me the way that he treated me. That's an interesting point. He grew up watching his, his father hit his mother, so it was all okay. Right, that's Did what, in his mind. In he, he yeah, exactly. And, and even though part of us can accept that as an excuse, it's not. You know, we, know, we understand. Because he, he did know better, didn't he? Don't, he did he ever he admit that he was in the wrong or shouldn't have done that? Or was that when the sweet times came? Um, no, it was. Okay, interesting. I, I don't recall him ever saying that he was sorry for the things that he did. And Very interesting. He apologized and by buying me things or giving me things. And it was, he never yeah, I wasn't bought things like gifts a lot or anything. A couple times I got flowers for being lied to and catching him in a lie. And after the incident happened a couple of times, there was a parade of just texts and phone calls. I mean like insistently calling like 30 times in the session, like it mm -hmm. was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. My phone bill was over four hundred dollars one time because just constant calling and calling and calling my phone. Didn't and that was much. again after he really messed up oh, and he yeah. knew it, and he was afraid of losing you. And then I was the most beautiful girl in the world, and he could yeah. not live without me. And he threatened to kill me if I ever left. Wow. And he, he said that anyone I was ever with after that, he would kill. So. Really, it's both of them said that, threatened to either to kill you, yourself personally, yeah. or any new boyfriend that came along. Mm -hmm. I uh, remember one time we had split up, and we had been split up for a while, and he saw me in the, I think the guy that I was talking to at the time, mm -hmm. and at a football game, and he just lost it. He what did he do? He had to be, be escorted out of the game. He had to be escorted out of the football arena. Yes. That is very, very frightening. And uh, do you know if any of these men are with new women now that they're abusive I again? I got a protective order mm -hmm. against him. Smart. And it was it was tough. I heard from someone that he was with somebody new, but I feel sorry for her. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. I hope she knows what she's getting herself into, and I hope that mm -hmm. she can recognize the signs possibly and not be too weak to walk away because nobody deserves that. Absolutely. No one deserves that, yet I understand how someone can diminish your self-esteem by constantly telling you things or treating you in a way or telling you it's all your fault, which you somewhat believe. Uh, especially sometimes it even comes in with other people in at school or in the community think kind of highly of them, but yours is all secretive behind closed doors. That makes it even harder for you to yeah. not think it's something I'm doing or it's my fault. So tell me, both of you, what else might you be able to say? How ha are you staying away from these types of relationships and, in a way, and say something the other young ladies might be able to learn from? Um, I would definitely say 
start making friends with stronger people. And I mean like mentally strong. People who are not afraid to say no or people who don't really, you know, take crap from other people. I mean, you're talking girlfriends even, right? Oh, Girls and guys. Guys, um, even a mentor, someone, mm -hmm. a, the people a teacher that you, you can provide. With. And someone you surround yourself with, definitely. The people you surround yourself with affect you, you who you are, who you, you will become. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I don't think in all the reading and research I've done about domestic violence and dating violence for this interview today, that I've heard that. Surround yourself with really strong, assertive people that can help you embrace that in yourself. And you realize what positive qualities that you have instead of ripping you apart. It's very important. How did you come to know that that was going to be a real key component to staying away from these types of relationships? I learned that through my advocate. Really? Yes. So you both did go for advocacy through Domestic Violence Association? Yes. yes. Okay. Wow. That's and, and what? how do they do? They do classes and they give you lots of information? Um, I met with my advocate. Um, a person to person basis just if I ever felt I had to talk then I could set up a meeting with her mm -hmm. and she has helped me to see that I'm so much better than that and I don't need that from anyone and before I didn't see that in myself at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. so that's a really good point for making sure that you let other people know to seek help um, and I would assume it's pretty, isn't it pretty well known by most young ladies out there and young men if this, they're in this kind of situation possibly uh, that the DVAC and those places are available? Oh, yes. I, um, I it does, it, and it does happen to young men. And I'm glad that you said yeah. that because mm -hmm. it, it does. Mm -hmm. It does. It's not just young women mm -hmm. that are affected by this, but um, young men also. Mm -hmm. And DVAC has done an amazing job. Right. And we're actually going to follow your interview with, with one of the representatives of DVAC here in Salina to tell us some more about what we can do or mm -hmm. what you know their agency does to help people such as yourself. And I do have to say from the website loveisrespect.org, I, I want to quote what they wrote there. They said, breaking up with an abusive partner needs to be like ripping off a band-aid. The faster the better. You don't owe them an explanation, a face-to-face -face breakup, or another chance, or even a return phone call. You don't owe them a return text. You owe yourself the peace of mind of being safe. Would you girls agree? Yes, yes. but I would say that's kind of the hard part. It is. <laughs> it is, it is. So the most difficult part. And I'd love to have you back another time. I'm sorry the interview's so short, but thank you both so much for coming and, and coming to the Joan Yorkovich Show to talk about a very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, rip the band-aid off. Yeah, there's so much to be said about, you know, the hard part. But would you say, and I want this to come across on the video yet, too, because I know a lot of people that don't catch the show watch the videos, that there is something to be done about just the clean break. Is that something you would, or how do you break up? I mean, you what do you suggest for breaking it? You okay, just have to. Cold turkey. You have to bait. force yourself to rip do it. the band-aid off. Answer the text. Yeah. Don't answer the mm -hmm. call. Mm -hmm. Block the number if you have mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Do not. If you need to get a protective order, I definitely recommend you do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I know. And just make sure you stay up on the protective order because a lot of times once they're it's broken, up there, they'll come back. So, so you sure. think that is effective? Because I've unfortunately heard, and we hear the stories, you know. Sometimes uh, it's not. You know, some of them, if they're that violent, they're going to find you and do whatever. But, of course, a lot of them might end up caught in jail, we hope. But you think a protective order is helpful? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Even if the guy or the woman who has the protective order against them, if they break the protective order, then call the police. Mm -hmm. They Absolutely. will go to jail. Because, Absolutely. I mean, it's just it's imperative that you really do have that clean break because if you let them back in just that one text, just that one mm -hmm. phone call, they'll mm -hmm. start roping you right back in. That they they see that for. glimmer of hope and they go for it all. That's so important what you just said to answer or reply to that one text or that one phone call. It starts the whole cycle again. 
and they feel they've got you and they're going to keep reining you in. I, you know, the hard part though, like you said, you know, the hard part is, you know, making that decision to just stop it. Did, did each of you, you had such a horrific, you both had such horrific stories that you told. Was there that one incident like yours at the party uh, that just said, that's it, I'm done? I'm I just couldn't take it anymore. Okay. And he threatened to kill himself. He threatened oh, to kill me. He threatened to kill anyone I was with. I was being absolutely. held down, and I yeah. literally thought I was going to die that night. And he tried choking you as well? Yeah. And okay. it's just, it, you. something's got to click sometimes. Mm -hmm. And only mm -hmm. you know when your breaking point is. Mm -hmm. When you've exactly. had enough, you've had enough. Mm -hmm. That was my breaking point. Mm -hmm. I knew right then, like, I just couldn't deal with it anymore. It was ripping my life apart. Mm -hmm. And you were afraid for your life in that moment. Yes. To and this day, I'm still afraid mm -hmm. to run mm -hmm. into him or anything. Mm -hmm. Like, I have anxiety, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask um, our next guest that comes on the show, you know, what, you know, we want to know why. Why are these guys like that? So let's see what her answer can be. So I'm going to let you head out and thank you again for coming in and being such brave souls. And maybe there will be an opportunity we'll have time. Uh, to I hope you can hear the girls because they seem to be quite They're very quiet. I had them up here the whole, as high as, okay. I, can, as, high as I can have them. Is this yeah. too closer? No, you're okay. perfect. perfect. She likes perfect. you to be, we need you to be a little closer, so, but then when you have two in here, it's a little more challenging. Anytime. Oh. We'll just pretend like we're here talking to each other. Okay. Okay, if I can get this to clear. Do you want to move this one a little bit more? Just whatever Cerise so thinks can. you can do there. Look at her. Okay. Fine. okay. There it went. I'm using that enough. You think I know? Fourteen to start, right, Sarah? Yep. Okay. This is Joan with the Joan Yurkovich Show, nine ten K I N A. Again, go to joanyurkovich.com for video outtakes, um, and uh, we also have uh, we're up on iTunes. We have links to that, and we have the podcasting. So go to joanyurkovich.com. And here we're back to follow up from the pretty uh, emotional, riveting interview we just finished with our two young victims of dating abuse. And we're here with Claudette, who has a position there at Domestic Violence Association of Central Kansas, commonly called here DVAC. And Claudette, you're the sexual assault victim advocate, right? Correct. Right. Well, tell me some about the work you do, because you apparently, as you told me in our pre-interview, do quite a bit with this age group with abuse and dating violence. Absolutely. It's actually probably, I mean, I, I love everything about my job, but probably my greatest passion is when I get to work with um, young, young women who have been victimized um, or are in unhealthy relationships, just to help them understand what a healthy relationship is supposed to look like, um, to empower them, to help them to understand that... Um, they have the right to have standards and to ask people to meet those standards and not to continuously think that um, they're to be treated however you know their partner thinks they should be treated. And so working with teenagers and college-aged uh, women is, uh, is very important to me. And so what do they present like? What are they saying when they walk in? I mean, are they coming in with bruises and tearful and, you know, do they feel like you're sort of the last result when they call DVAC? What, do you, what is that like? Um, actually, they come to us in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes it's simply a phone call because they're not ready to, to put the face to the, to the voice. And so we'll talk them through things. Sometimes they do walk right into the office. Um, I go out and do a lot of presentations to, uh, we cover a 10 county region and um, in the office here in Salina, we cover Saline and Dickinson County. So I go out into a lot of the high schools, middle schools, and colleges and do presentations um, about dating violence and dating sexual violence. And so through that, sometimes afterwards, someone will ask if they can speak with me. Um, really during the high school and middle school, um, teachers will often allow the, you know, kind of give a, a preface that if they're not comfortable